Yeah, let's bravely world. Welcome to you back to the second session of the day. We've now exceeded over 2 million views across our 90 episodes. And as we lead into our 100th episode, we would love you to post a short video on how JLF's Brave New World has impacted your worldview. You can post it on our email ID, contact at teamworkarts.com. Those of you who missed our earlier sessions, uh, defining luxury, Tarun Telyani and Himanshi Vardhan, in conversation with Nanita Kalra and all of the others featuring His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Margaret Atwood, Oran Pamuk, Harvard Jacobson, you can catch these on our Facebook page, JLF LitFest, or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur LitFest JLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM, Bajate Raho. Our next session is Writing from the Brink. Brian Keenan in conversation with Salil Tripathi. Brian Keenan became headline news when he was kidnapped by the Shiite militiamen in 1985 and held hostage in Beirut for four and a half years. The intensity and horror of that traumatic encounter is recounted in an evil cradling. His next book, I'll Tell Me Ma, is a memoir about growing up in Belfast. In conversation with writer, journalist, and human rights activist Salil Tripathi, he speaks of the trauma of incarceration and the will to survive. Brian Keenan has worked as a teacher and community arts worker. In 1985, he took up a post at the American University of Beirut, where he was abducted and held hostage by Islamic terrorists for five years. Two years after his release, he wrote an account of his captivity titled An Evil Cradling, which has since won four national and international awards. He has since written four other books between extremes, Four Quarters of Light, Turlo, and I'll Tell Me Ma. Salil Tripathi is the author of Offense, The Hindu Case, The Colonel Who Would Not Repent, and Detours, Song of the Open Road. He also chairs Penn International Writers in Prison Committee. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it in the comment section below. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. And of course, if we drop off, just hang in there. Or we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian Keenan in conversation with Salil Tripathi. Salil, over to you. Thank you, Shonjo. And hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening, wherever you are. <laughs> a very strange kind of setting to have a conversation for a Jaipur Literature Festival. Usually you have lots of people milling about and curious about the audience, but we have to do what we have. And it is indeed a brave new world we are in. We are in a very unusual time. And also we are talking about moments on the brink. I'm going to be speaking to Brian, with whom I had the privilege and honor of having a conversation last year at the festival in Belfast. So I would urge those of you interested in Brian to certainly uh, check that video out, which is on the JLF channel as well. Uh, we are going to take that conversation forward, but we will be visiting some of the themes we discussed then, because there is always a first time and sometimes it's worth recounting. The most remarkable thing about Brian is, of course, the fact that he, the warmth of his humor, the tenacity of his courage, and the spirit of compassion that uh, he personifies with what he has been through and what he feels about what he has gone through. Brian, we are in an unusual time, as I said. We are in an enforced lockdown and imagining what being in prison might feel like. We are at home against our will, but we also have our comforts. I'm able to talk to you and many more who have signed on to this festival today. I'm able to buy most of what I need. I'm able to step out too. And in many societies, I wouldn't get punished for doing that. I'm able to get my basic needs at my doorstep and I have to follow some rules for my good and for other people's good. So this is not really captivity. Your experience was cruel and different. You've spoken about it before, but there are probably viewers tuning in today who don't know. Take us to Beirut. What took you there and what happened? Uh, it was a kind of strange choice. I suppose coming from Belfast and going to Beirut, it was a bit like uh, from the uh, frying pan to the fire. Uh, but that wasn't my experience of it. Um, I've always wanted to travel. I think travel is about enrichment uh, and opening yourself to new experiences. However, 
the experience I had in Beirut was not pleasant. Um, I I went there because I was particularly interested in the Palestinian situation, and uh, I thought this was a way to understand better, um, to be there, to meet, to talk, to visit Shadil and Sabra. Um, I had not intended to stay as long as I did. Um, I was only going for a year, perhaps two. Um, I like teaching young adults. Um, and I find when I was in Lebanon that I had to work very hard <laughs> because my students, uh, when you ask them to do anything, they, they don't. Um, and they always prepare and can't prepare. Um, I, I miss them dreadfully and that I was only there for a very short time. And you know, when you just begin to make relationships um, outside your own cultural understanding, which is where the enrichment comes from, um, they become kind of permanent. You make friends very quickly when you're a stranger. Um, however, um, the friends I ended up with uh, were not easy to uh, get along with. Um, it was kind of like um, five years in an, um, in, an inhospitable and uh, profoundly um, damaging uh, landscape and confinement. It was not landscape. Uh, the cell was six foot by four foot. Um, you got out in the morning to go to the toilet and came back. Um, the door shut and that was it. Until, and the light went out and that was it until the next morning. Uh, you didn't know it was the next morning because you, no clock on the wall. Um, uh, apart from the call to prayer, which told you it was the dawn of a new day. And that was all. Surprisingly, in those situations, now that I reflect back on it, um, and I don't speak Arabic, um, I come to find uh, the call to prayer uh, early, which told me it was a new day, but it was uh, strangely comforting to hear this religious chant in a foreign language, and you're in a hole in the ground with men who were kind of thoroughly evil. Um, but somehow it was uh, enriching. It was like someone put an arm around you. Um, and the irony of it is one of the worst of my captors uh, was the one who sang this call to prayer so sweetly. Uh, he had the voice of an angel, but the mind of a poisonous snake, unfortunately, um, goes with the circumstances. Right. Uh, you recently spoke, uh, I mean, at, at the former correspondent in the BBC, and about a nine-minute piece you did called The Visitation of the Megai, um, where you were kind of reflecting on what lockdown does to people, what being incarcerated means. Um, I mean, compared to what you went through, what others are going through is you know, millions of that or, you know, billions of that. Um, but it, it has an impact on one's mind. Uh, People are talking about mental illness. People are talking about how to keep the spirits alive. Even the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, spoke about mental health yesterday in one of his interviews. So I'm just curious, what, what keeps people going? What is the philosophical underpinning behind this? Um, I don't know. Um, I think there's a process that happens um, when, well, certainly for me, it was a case of, uh, I spent about nine months in solitary confinement, in this small dark cell. Um, but then they give you a stub of a candle to eat your one meal a day by. Um, and that was your brief uh, period of light. Um, but I think what, what happens in, in those processes of extreme isolation with um, all the time horror hovering about in the cell, waiting for the next beating. Um, was that you go through a process of a kind of emotional and psychological meltdown. Um, so the person who you thought yourself to be, the person who you thought yourself um, capable of being, uh, disappeared very rapidly. Uh, um, not in any way that you could prevent this happening. Um, but, but I don't know, I suppose at some point, um, I remember particularly badly being beaten or something, and something, so the me 
that had been taken to that cell had kind of evaporated quite painfully. Uh, and I was able to um, watch myself and what was happening to me. And so I suppose it's like you jump into another skin and you watch what's happening to you. Um, and that became kind of fascinating for me um, because all I had was my mind and that alone I possessed. And that was my only defense. It was my only escape. The only way out of where I was was in, to go in very, very deeply. Uh, and that is as painful a process as physical torture is. Uh, but the end result, uh, in a way, it's, I reflect back, was quite healing because I was able to take myself to a place which was very rich, which was very illuminating, which was somehow at some times disturbing, but at all times uh, revelatory. I used to wake in the morning and ask myself, have I got enough to get myself through the day? Thinking after months and months and months of this that, that I can't, but there always is. There is always more. Uh, we never reach the bitter end. The bitter end is just a thing on a ship that tells you when you throw out the anchor and it hits its bitter end, it just tells the sailor that there is more to go, but you're at a point and you know there's more to go. So, uh, but Sally, that can become, I, I kind of began to understand, but that can be very dangerous to be able to take yourself to another place. Mm -hmm. um, who would have Freud defined madness as the uh, the flight from a terrible or traumatic reality to a safe place and the choice to stay there. So um, I had to come back. I had to put my hands out and touch the walls and confirm that this, this is where you are, Brian. It doesn't matter where you've been. This is where you are. But in that long process of finding a way out by going in, it's as if, to use a metaphor, my arm became wings. Mm. And I could, in a very real sense to me, fly out of that confinement and out of that cell over landscapes that I didn't know uh, but were fascinating. So um, the mind is indeed, as Milton said, its own place. And then itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. And I find that the power of the mind is greater uh, than the butt end of a Klasnikov or whatever else they wanted to use to beat you in. There is something, a residual powerhouse inside us. But sometimes the journey to find that place is difficult. Um, yeah. But then bruises and bloody marks go away. Uh, in a way, Sally, I once uh, was talking about this, that. You know, it says in the Quran that when the Prophet is speaking to his followers about the taking of hostages, taking, the Prophet says to his followers, give them, i.e. the captives, the Quran that they may take with them when they go more than was taken from them. Well, I'm not a great believer in religious books, though I peruse their truth. Um, but that's what happened. Not because of anything in the Quran, I'm not religious, but that's what happened. Um, in the strange and terrifying irony, they gave me more than they took from me, and they didn't even know it. Yes, these inadvertent things are amazing. I mean, what, when you were talking about stretching your arms and feeling the wings, I, what came to my mind was my friend Murray Hebert, who was a Canadian-American journalist. Uh, he was my colleague. and. I lived in Singapore then, and he was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, and uh, he was, I mean, held accountable for a contempt of court. You know, as journalists tend to run into these problems, and he was in jail for three months, if I'm, or a few weeks, at least six weeks. And um, I asked him what it felt when he came out, and he said that when he came out, the hardest thing for him to realize was that he could cross the road when he wanted to, and he did not need anyone's permission. So the very fact that what's taken away is in a sense a dignity and to rest it back 
is a monumental achievement that you've shown and your writing and through your very brave act of going back to Lebanon, which is what I wanted to come back to, that you are, you're thinking and you've been working on for some time, writing a collection of stories, fiction, about uh, your time in, about Beirut, not about your time in Beirut necessarily. Now, the question I have is, is does fiction offer you the freedom to see what you wish by imagining an alternative past or alternative future? What does fiction do that non-fiction cannot? And what is it that non-fiction offers that fiction can. Okay, fiction's harder. <laughs> I uh, I would rather do uh, ten days on a building site than ten minutes looking at a blank piece of paper. Um, fiction carries with it a terrible responsibility. Um, you know, uh, words are very important, and how we use them is very important. Um, how they are received. So a fiction writer has to create uh, a communicable world with real people in them, with real issues. Um, and the kind that I suppose for me, writing a fiction is like um, an act of confession. Um, and I think that in writing, you know, Sally, it's like, you have a blueprint for a story that you're going to write. And then um, when you sit down in front of a blank piece of paper or the typewriter, or whatever you work on, the tape recorder, um, and you begin, you have to allow the process to take charge. If you sit looking at the blueprint all the time, you won't really get a story that is revelatory or carries some sort of meaning beyond the words on the paper. Um, so you have to find the capacity to trust the process in which you're engaged. Uh, and in many instances, what happens is you go, you stray away from the blueprint you have and you end up somewhere else. But that somewhere else you might not use in the story, but what it does is it gives you a vantage point from which to look at the story you intended to write from a different place. Um, also, um, when you trust the process, I think it engages you in personal change, you know, uh, because all the characters that you create are, are, are in some way related to yourself, because you have to have some kind of uh, intellectual empathy when you're creating another human being, and emotional empathy. So. Trusting the process means letting the confession of writing change yourself. I, I once put it to a, a friend uh, at a, another conference, he was a writer, a poet, and we talked about um, writing. And I said to him, well, uh, his first name was Sam. I said, Sam, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, the best of stories write themselves. You have just still got to allow that story to give itself to you, to create the space inside yourself to let the story talk to you. Then you have to do the work to shape it. Um, um, so, um, and it's, it's, it's not really the confessional aspect, but it's, am I sure that I'm saying what I want to say and what I want to be meaningful? Um, that have I got the right moral authority to be creating this world? which I expect, which hope other people will, will uh, come into our visit for a while. So um, I think writing facts are easier because they're your guiding line. You just follow along um, and kind of produce the facts in a way that are intelligible. Um, what you're doing in fiction is you're creating a very real and tangible world, which is going to... Uh, capture your, your reader uh, and perhaps in some way take them to another place which may involve them looking at themselves, uh, I'm being honest. So I find it difficult and the only way I can write is let the story talk itself to me. I have to be honest and allow it to change me. Um, stories after all are given to us. Uh, and we have to kind of 
honor that gift. That, that's very interesting because, you know, I suppose it's like going back to Shelley that, you know, we look for before and after and find for what is not because I was talking some years ago and I keep, I mean, I've had several conversations with him and he's also a Jaipur uh, regular, Ramesh Gunasekar, the British Sri Lankan writer. And he had once said to me that, you know, the ultimate uh, virtual reality is a book. And uh, since I've written nonfiction mainly, he said that you guys have it harder because you have to be accurate and get your facts right. And we can make stuff up. And I've always said that making stuff up is harder. And he thinks, okay. the other, I suppose we always like what we don't. I mean, we always yeah. appreciate what the other one. And that's, 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 that's a sign of progress, I suppose. But because you are going back to a region that you were at and had um, obviously very sharp and some unpleasant, very extremely unpleasant memory, what is the role of memory in writing? To what extent is a fiction that you write set in Lebanon? influenced by what happened to you and to what extent is with all the reading you've done and uh, is it a way to recapture that remembered past or is it something that you want to create completely out of out of blue? Two things Sally, uh, when I decided to go back there was, I thought there was a reason for it mm -hmm. and it wasn't because I was locked up for five years. I sat in 2006 and watched the saturation bombing of Israel on Lebanon. Uh, and so, and I had once met and spoken to at length face to face with Ehud Olmert uh, at the time. He wasn't uh, then Prime Minister of Israel, and I was very impressed by what he said at that time about um, the engineering of peace and accord uh, with with others. Uh, unfortunately, when he took office. Um, he just signed the signature, the blank upon this. Um, two things struck me, Sally. Um, the students that I had taught were not terrorists. Mm -hmm. I didn't know whether they were alive or not. Um, and two, I had this unexpected feeling that um, something was being stolen from me. Mm -hmm. um, whoever it was, fighter pilots or whoever, but not getting into the politics of it, but uh, I just, this was being stolen from me and Lebanon owed me something. I didn't know what it was, uh, but I was going to collect. Uh, so <laughs> when, and when I did decide to go back, I clearly had it in my head that I wasn't going to lay ghosts. Um, I read an article by Elias Khoury, uh, a very a quite brilliant Lebanese writer, Mm -hmm. writes a bit like Tolstoy in, in a way, uh, where he said in an interview in the New York Times, review books, um, there are stories lying about the streets of Lebanon and Beirut that people care to pick them up. And what he was inferencing was that the Lebanese weren't not telling their own stories the way they should um, for whatever reasons. And I decided, right, I'm going to take them out as well. So I went off. I traveled around Lebanon on my own. I had to go and get permission from Hezbollah of all places to, uh, to go and visit some areas. Uh, and uh, whatever story I find lying on the street, uh, by however I recognize that story, um, that was the story I wrote. I'll give you one example. When I went back, I traveled with. Uh, a young Lebanese man who had come to live in Dublin and study here the same year as I disappeared. He had not returned to Lebanon since, and I was going back. So he said, because he lived here in Dublin, he said, can I go with you? He said, sure, come to your question. Anyway, went back, and we went to Tripoli where he lived. And he was telling me the story of what was happening in the streets of Tripoli while I was locked up in a home. And it was very interesting, we walked around. So he was telling me what was happening out in the world, which I had no awareness of. And then he said, as we walked down the street, which all the locals called the Champs-Élysées, <laughs> and we were walking down, and he said, there's a cafe here, which everyone, the old men went to in the morning to play damas. And he said, once 10 o'clock came, everyone cleared and went home, because that's when the shooting started. And he, he said, they would shoot at anything. 
a piece of paper, a newspaper blowing in the wind. They would shoot it to bits. Cats running down across the street, they would shoot it to bits. Just shot at anything. But he told me, he said, so the only one we're playing dumbbells here, 10 o'clock come, clear, silent. And then he said, but the owner of the cafe put his son out on the street in a chair with a sign around his neck saying, I am a donkey. And so the shooting began. And I thought, hi, kid, what was going on there? You know, a father puts his son out in the street and bullets flying all around the place. And, and I said to my friend, what, what, what happened? He said, I don't know. I left Lebanon. I don't know what happened to it. Um, so anyway, I let that pass and went on traveling around to find the other stories. But it kept coming back to me. Why was this boy put on the street? What was the significance of this sign? Um, the boy was going to get shot, that's for sure. Uh, why would a father do this? You know? And so I began to tell the story, uh, why this happened. Uh, and the story got longer and longer. And it became a kind of, I don't know, it became a kind of novel art or a kind of a way of exploring uh, the issues, the dy dynamics of human relationships that are mirrored in some strange way in the balance in, in the civil war in the streets. Um, but it was one just personal story, and I became fascinated by it. So that was one. I, uh, I, anytime I'm in Lebanon, uh, I go up into the mountains, um, to the Gwadeshi Valley, which is a stunning place, absolutely stunning. And I, I have never known why, why, why I keep going there. Why? And then I realized it was something to do with um, the great poet Khalil Gibran. Uh, he lived there and he grew up there. And I thought, what's the connection with this? And when I was a boy in Belfast at 15 or 16, 14, I remember picking up a book of poems by Khalil Gibran. And I thought, that's a strange connection. So I read a story about meeting the ghost of Khalil Gibran. And I talk about his life and his writings and why he wrote through his paintings, not his poetry, because he was a very fine painter. Um, so those are the kind of things, the stories you find lying about the street. Um, they take possession of you. Uh, and you have to write them because that's the gift that's given. Um, like most things, when a gift is given, there's a responsibility on you to share it somewhere. So I did that, but one of those strange things I'm trying to come to about this thing about memory. Part of my survival in Lebanon was dreaming. Mm. Uh, because you can go into your dreams uh, to get out of the place where. Um, and when I came back, I didn't really have nightmares or stuff. I, I didn't have panic attacks. I just, but I missed uh, the lucid dreaming that I had had for so long. Uh, and, but when I, so that had all gone. And when I went back all those years later, suddenly all this lucid dreaming came back. Hi, uh, that's something I still don't understand. That, that, that. So remember, that had nothing to do with the place. I, I, I wasn't looking for ghosts and they didn't worry me. Uh, but, but suddenly the dreaming mind came back very lush and very sensuous. And I thought, well, in a way, I suppose dreaming gives you the landscape of language that day, day to day life doesn't have. Um, so I let... I let the dreams, wherever they were coming from, um, mm -hmm. tell stories to me. Um, and there was a story about meeting uh, an, old, uh, an old man who was running art gallery in uh, Astrophia. But all the paintings on his wall were by Gustav Klimt. And when I went into the gallery, because I liked Klimt's painting, he was playing Mahler music. And we talked, and I thought, hi, Ronnie. You know, Here's uh, all these images by a Jewish painter. Um, this Lebanese man is playing Mahler, a Jewish musician, uh, which was very moving inside the painting. Um, I thought, there's got to be a story here. So that formed all of the story. And, and there's a few more, but they were the, you know, the happenings. I, I, I didn't go with a blueprint. I just went to find the stories that were lying in the street because that's what Lebanon owed me. Right.
Uh, we have two minutes before we go and take some oh. questions from the audience. But before I do that, I do have one last question. So if you can, um, I mean, I have several more, but uh, I, I do want to ask this question to you, which is the power that the hostage has over the captor, because I know at least a couple of other political prisoners through my work with the writing writers who have been in prison through, uh, I've got to know them very well in my work with Penn. And one of the things that I hear is that they do have a strange power. So if you, uh, A, what that power is, and the other is, of course, uh, if you if and when you do meet the captors again, what is the kind of thing you tell them? I mean, what is it that you want in them to know? I've I've, I've often thought um, when I <laughs> sometimes when I was walking around the streets of Lebanon, I kept looking at people saying, "Was it you? Was it you?" Uh, but then I thought, well, if Said was Said was a very very uh, brutal man, quite malicious deeply disturbed, um, but if he come up to me in the street and uh, introduce himself, I think I would probably say to him, sit down and have a coffee, and then I would look him directly in the eye, which I've never been able to do, and say, Saeed, you tell me what you were thinking when you done those things to me, and if you can, and if you will, I can set you free, Saeed. Mm. You know, uh, you, you kind of take on things. And after all, I've been in very deep, disturbed psychological places myself. So I kind of had, knew where he might be. But I have this profound sense that if he could talk that out to me, that I could set him free, take all that pain off him. I don't know whether that would ever happen. Yeah, and but this is exactly what Mathida, who is a very good friend of mine, and she's also often at the Jaipur Festival uh, from Myanmar, uh, and she was in jail for five and a half years in 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 Burma during the uh, during the military years, and uh, she used to say that that you know she was being interrogated, she was being questioned all the time, and she would say keep at it and keep doing it, and the police investigator actually told her that you know you're making us your prisoner. And so there is a very strange power that comes through, and uh, I mean, absolutely, have the power to make him free is is very powerful and very important. Uh, we have a question. We have several questions here, um, and I'm going to turn to the first one here from Sachdev Ramakrishna to you, Brian. That uh, with having John McCarthy as your company, uh, was it a reasonable solace for you? And what is your view of the countries of your citizenship, which were not quite forthcoming? in their effort for your release. Now, I understand one reason was that uh, UK in particular in those days had a very strong view about not negotiating with uh, uh, what they call extremist and terrorist organizations. So those are the two in one. And I do have a few more and we have a few more minutes. So if you can respond to these, yeah. Well, my, I'm an Irish citizen. So uh, I kind of got very angry so I, I had been taken uh, because Ireland's got nothing to do with what was going on out there. And I went on hunger strike for a very long time uh, because they wouldn't tell me why they were keeping me. Uh, and then when they told me about uh, the bombing of Gaddafi's palace in Tripoli, I just said, what's that got to do with me? Uh, I'm Irish, nothing to do with me. Um, uh, so, Part of the problem with that was, I told him I was Irish, but uh, shortly after I was taken, because I was born in Belfast, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, another British citizen has been taken in Lebanon. So therefore I became a spy. Uh, and they <laughs> now had evidence of it, that I was a spy. So that made life very difficult for me. Um, I was with McCarthy for quite a long time. And look, John is a very well-spoken Englishman, awful, awful English. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, if I had met him in the street before this happened, I wouldn't have liked him and he would not have liked me. Uh, but under those circumstances, I said to him when we were put the cell together, if you don't survive here, John, I won't. And if I don't survive here, you won't. Uh, so, you know, mm -hmm. we, we both quickly understood that survival is mutual and that's what we need to get through this. 
you need to survive and I need to help you. And I need to survive and you need to help me. And therefore, the British and Irish question was answered right away. Yes. I mean, I, I only wish uh, the politicians who took the Brexit decision would think so <laughs> practically than that. But I mean, Fintan O'Toole, of course, from Ireland has been writing magnificently about it for the last few years. Um, the next question is from Om Prakash Parikh, um, uh, who asked whether, do you think that as a writer, that language can convey the traumatic experience that you've been through during your confinement? Where do the words come from and do the words help? Um, how, e how easy it is to encapsulate the experience in language? Uh, well, I think possibly for myself, um, as a young man, I always like reading poetry uh, because of its intensity and because of the images that uh, poets can throw up in a few words. Um, it's like a painter puts two or three colors together and it changes. Um, so I, I, I kind of had that, um, and I think um, you need to have, you need to find words that are not in sort of everyday common uses because you're, what you're writing about is not an everyday common experience. However, when you live in a very heightened reality, your mind works in a very heightened capacity. So um, I was able, I suppose, to draw from that well of words and poetry that I read when I, when I, when I was a young man. Um, always been fascinated by the power of words. Um, and here I was in a place where I could create whatever I wanted to. Um, so uh, I think the other thing was, Sally, when I come back, um, sat down to think about writing this book. I really didn't know how to write about a time when nothing happens. Take you out of your cell to bring you back, turn the light out, that's it, to the next day. But everything happens in here and in here. How do you write about that? Um, so whatever blueprint I planned wasn't doing it for me. So Somebody said to me, a, a painter friend of mine said to me, and I kind of throw away phrase, just be brutally honest, Brian. Mm. And in that phrase, just be brutally honest was okay. Uh, so I allowed myself, I lived in a small college in the west of Ireland. There was nobody near me. I went out at night. I couldn't see anything because it was dark. But, and, and very much in a way, it was like being back in that bad place in Lebanon. Uh, and I, in whatever kind of psychological shift you make, transported myself back to that worst of all possible times uh, to try and take hold of it. So it was a matter of, I knew what that story was because I experienced it. All I needed to do was tell it back to myself and let myself speak to me the way I had spoken to myself and myself. And I think the language comes to you. Um, yep. Because if you try and dress things up, Sally, it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah, no, absolutely. You've said stories come to you, languages come to you. Now, you spoke about dreams, which was very important because in your memoir that you've written, you do talk about nightmares. So moving from nightmares to dreams itself is a very important journey. I think we have time for one question and maybe one more, but I'll take the first one here from Rohan. And in a way, the question he asked takes us back to something you said early on. Uh, and the question is, now the screen has moved, so let me just push it back a little. Yes. Um, would you draw an analogy between the what, ha what was going on in Ireland and in Lebanon, given the fact that there, was, there were explosions and certainly cases of torture? And the reason I'm not drinking it is with one of the first things you said, that when you went from Belfast to Beirut, and you, I think you said that it was go for like going from the frying pan to fire. So were there parallels you saw? So, or was it a completely different universe? Um, I, 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 I think Belfast is not Beirut, and they're not uh, they're not comparable. Um, and I've been in both places, and I've been at the Colonnades uh, in both places. Um, I didn't when I walked to uh, the university in the morning to my 
teaching job, I would see bodies on the street from the previous night's fighting. Um, the everybody was carrying guns in broad daylight, even young men. Everybody had a pistol down. The small of their back, or they were carrying Kalashnikov. Um, this was a city, you know, and kind of collapse. Um, there wasn't any sense of um, joint purpose. Uh, everybody was at each other's throats, and it was bedlam and mayhem, and it was filled with blood and murder. Um, Belfast didn't have that. You know, my father went to work and I went to work while all the troubles were going on. And in certain areas of the cities that certain people didn't go to, but uh, people were able to articulate their, their agenda and their reasons and why they were doing things. Whether you accepted them or not, um, they were able to kind of give a historical and political perspective. It seemed to me that in uh, Lebanon, People didn't really know, uh, and they did, weren't able, certainly not to me, uh, to articulate either why I was held or what was happening. Uh, it was like everybody was living on frayed nerves, uh, and the only way they got through the day was twitching a pistol in their hand. Uh, so I... I I just couldn't see it. it was, I, went, I remember going to the movies in Lebanon, all these young men were sitting there and they were watching Rambo or whatever. And remember, their whole world is fixated on these American movies. They shoot them up, blow them up, stuff. And whenever some guy came up with a gun, they would be able to name the gun, especially what it was and who made it and that. Uh, and I thought, you know, here's part of the problem. It's the world that they see, the world that they receive, you know, yeah. uh, and there's murder on that, that back, you know. Uh, so, you know, you come to a kind of understanding that, um, look, we, we have the science, we can map the human genome, the human body, we can uh, articulate and, uh, everything about it. But there isn't one gene in the human body that defines or makes a terrorist. There isn't a terrorist gene. John Donne, the great poet, said, a twisted nerve, a ganglion gone wrong, predestinates a sinner or the said, I don't know, terrorist sinners are all socially made. You know, there are kind of social circumstances for why these things happen. And it's just people's inability to articulate their grievance on other people's refusal to listen to what that grievance is and what happens. That is People so powerful. That is so powerful in our current time, given you know the unrest about uh, racism around the world, unrest about inequality, and the unrest about who gets who is being sent to work and so on. Inability to listen, inability to address uh, long-standing grievances is at the heart of many of the uh, problems that we are faced with. The most powerful image that I get from you, I mean, this is the second time you've spoken and I've read your books, is the one of the candle. Even if it's a small candle, it lights and it illuminates. And you've been a candle. You've been illuminating everyone. Thank you so much for your time. We had more questions, but um, I'm afraid we have to stop and over to you, Sanjo. And thank you again, Brian. And goes far too quick, Sally. Indeed, it does. <laughs> Take thank care, my friend. Thank, thank you. you so much, Brian Keenan, and thank you so much, Salid Tripathi. And absolutely, like you said, you know, there is no terrorist DNA uh, stamped into our being. And it's really an issue of being able to listen. But also our hearts and prayers go out to all of those other people who are incarcerated against the police across the world, even as we speak in the safety of our homes through social media. And to them, more strength to whatever they're fighting for, whatever they're standing for, and to Penn and, and all of the Penn colleagues across the world, I think, who've been also doing an incredible job bringing their voices uh, for the rest of us to be able to understand and take forward. Thank you both. That was a really special session. And I'm sorry I couldn't, we couldn't send you all of the questions, uh, but perhaps we will do later. Thank you to our official radio partners, 
uh, Red FM Bajate Raho. And uh, please do remember to log in on Wednesday, the 22nd of July, for another set of great sessions. The World's War, Forgotten Soldiers of Empire. David Olusuga, in conversation with Yasmin Khan, describes how Europe's Great War became the world's war, a multiracial, multinational struggle fought in Africa and Asia, as well as in Europe, which pulled in men and resources from across the globe, especially of the era's racial obsessions, which dictated which men would serve, how they would serve, and to what degree they would suffer as vivid and moving as it is revelatory and authoritative, the World's War explores the experiences and sacrifices of 4 million non-European, non-white people. The stories have remained too long in the shadow. This will be at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 2.30 p.m. British Summer Time, and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And our second session on 26th of July will be Anita Nair, writers, a coup in conversation with Ashok Ferry takes us through the inspirations and teachings of her creative journey, spanning from the anchor of her Malayali roots to the range of her prolific literary repertoire, spanning from fiction and poetry, children's books and travel writing, to the fundamental nature of writers and all those who strive to tell stories. This will be at 8.30 p.m. IST, 4 p.m. British Summer Time, and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Stay safe and see you on Wednesday.